Yes. All right. Three folks. Maybe that's just us. That's just us, but people are coming in right now. It takes oh, a my. few seconds to get everybody in. And John, we had about 17 people registered for today. No kidding. Wow. Yep. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so are we live? We are live, yep. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, John Cafala, Slumber County Commissioner, District 1. This is our monthly, uh, what we're calling now, Fort Collins Laporte uh, Community Conversation. I am here with Michelle Bird and uh, Pam Marcus Bowsey. And the, the, uh, the agenda for today or the game plan is that uh, uh, we'll turn it over to Michelle in a moment who can explain a little bit about the, the Zoom platform and the chat room and, and how folks can ask questions and offer input, et cetera. And then we'll turn it over to Pam who is with our strategic uh, broadband broadband strategic initiative, excuse me. And she can give us an update on the on Larimer County's efforts and everywhere is somewhere. And uh, um, you know, the speed test, the importance of the speed test and what we're doing and why we hope folks will participate in that. So uh, with that said, we had 17 folks sign up. It looks like we have a total of 13 participants at this time uh, and I, Michelle, does that include the three of us? Yes, Commissioner, that, that we have 10 attendees and three panelists, so there's 13 of us total here today. Okay, so, so more, more folks may join up, but it is about it is about 8.30. We're scheduled to go to 10, but again, I, I imagine folks won't complain if we don't use up the entire one and a half hours. So, Michelle, would you be kind enough to give us a little overview of the Zoom platform? Of course. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle Bird. I'm the Public Affairs Director for Larimer County, and I'm happy to join you this morning and be your host on Zoom. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us before for a community conversation with John virtually, um, we do use the Zoom webinar feature, which is a little bit different than a Zoom meeting. If you've done Zoom meetings before, you'll notice you can only see the four of us, um, and, and that's a safety issue um, so that People can't just, since it's open to the public, people can't just get on and share their screen and maybe share things that are inappropriate or illegal. Um, kind of same goes for the, the chat feature. You'll notice that you don't necessarily have access to a chat feature. Um, that's so that you guys, not you guys, I, don't, I trust all of you, but so that someone can't get on and send out a link um, that some of you may click on unknowingly and it, and it could impact your computer or send a virus of some kind. So how we handle interaction with this meeting is we use two different things. First, the Q&A feature. Um, so you're more than welcome at any point to ask your questions, um, type them in that Q&A feature, and we'll go ahead and try to answer those live. Um, secondly, the second way you can ask a question is to raise your hand. And so there should be a little button as well um, so you can raise your hand to speak. Now I do see that we do have a caller um, and so if our caller wants to speak as well, what they need to do is press star nine and that'll raise your hand for you. Um, once it's your turn to speak, I will let you know that I'm calling your name and giving you the ability to speak and you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, for those of you on the computer, there's, there's a button for you to unmute. It's typically in the bottom left hand corner. Um, our callers to unmute yourself, you'll hit star six, but I'll remind you of that. I don't anticipate or expect you all to remember the little tricks and tips um, for our callers in. But yeah, that's kind of just how the Zoom feature or the webinar feature works. And um, thank you all for being here this morning. Thanks very much, Michelle. Pam, you're on. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Kafalis, for hosting this uh, community conversation and update on Larimer Broadband Initiative and the speed test. And thank you, Michelle, for coordinating all of this technology and the parts and pieces. It's no easy task these days, but you seem to have mastered it. So um, much appreciated. So I am Pam Marcus Bousey, and I'm a project manager with Larimer County IT. And I'm here to give a, an update on the Larimer Broadband Strategic Initiative and the new speed test that Larimer County has launched. So I am going to use our technology to share my screen and hopefully that will um, provide you a view of a PowerPoint. So um, let me know, I guess I'll rely on Michelle and 
Commissioner Kafalis to let me know if it's presenting okay. It looks like it's working so far. Okay, good deal. So as mentioned, this is an update on Larimer Broadband and the speed test. And um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to relay what the county knows. Um, there is much that the county is seeking to know through this Larimer Broadband Strategic Initiative. I'm going to provide an overview and some context and then resources and reference information. I'll provide information about the new speed test and I'll take questions, which um, as I mentioned, um, you know, there's, there's much we know, there's much we, we uh, don't yet, um, so might possibly have to research answers or defer to another subject matter expert, but um, we will do what we can. So um, first of all, I want to just talk about the initiative itself, so hopefully you can see this visual that we have, um, and bear with me. Um, so I'll just give a little context about the visual and what the strategic initiative is and isn't. Um, so with the with its broadband strategic initiative, Larimer County, while it's not a broadband provider, is an initiator. The county's been asked to facilitate activities that lead to solutions, um, identifying and fostering steps that lead qualified partners, internet service providers, and rural utilities as examples um, to making broadband improvements in underserved areas. So though the county is not an internet connectivity, or is not in the internet connectivity business, Larimer Broadband's efforts are intended to better position partners who are in broadband connectivity or related utility and infrastructure businesses to engage in work that will bring improvements. So um, as you can see in this, um, in this visual, uh, the initiative builds on milestones and accomplishments to climb towards fostering improvements as it's illustrated here. So the milestones include a feasibility study, which was completed at the end of 2018, and I will provide information on where you can access the report from that study and get all of that information. Um, and then we are currently in the planning partnerships and funding exploration um, phase. So we're exploring issues and determining the best strategies to address um, gaps in connectivity and issues with broadband um, service. Um, and then project readiness and policy decision, it's not yet in progress and this will build on the milestone that we're, or the phase that we're currently in. And then execution of policies and feasible projects. So again, not yet, yet in progress, it'll build on milestone three. So um, the county often and understandably receives questions about specific connectivity gaps that need to be addressed in specific areas. Um, I'll say that probably about 90% of the questions that I receive, they are valid um, and under, again, understandable. Um, and, and basically it's, you know, that internet is insufficient in a, in a given area and, and what is being done. So um, in order to answer these questions and move towards project readiness, um, to address these types of needs, milestone two, which is, you know, again, the phase that we're in needs to be completed in order to embark on milestone three and, and so on. So um, milestone two, where the phase that we're currently in includes uh, four different goals for 2020 that we're actively working on. One of those is the broadband initiative operations, which is the initiative itself and keeping resources available and keeping that initiative going. Um, it's gained a lot of momentum. There have been a lot of accomplishments and activities that, that have been um, achieved. Um, but as you can see, we're not finished yet. So keeping that initiative going and keeping the momentum going and building on the momentum is imperative. Um, so the speed test I'm going to talk about, that is something that was launched on July 1st, is a wonderful collaborative effort, and it's, um, it is an effort that will provide a great deal of data and information um, that will help in achieving all the steps that we need to um, move towards uh, internet connectivity improvements. And um, again, I'll, I'll share some more information about how you can participate and encourage others to do so. Cultivating partnerships is also an incredibly important step. As I mentioned, um, the county 
uh, can play a role in this and the role is initiator and um, those that are qualified to provide service. So basically to provide the infrastructure and operate it um, are the partnerships that are, are very important to cultivate. Um, those are the entities that would be eligible for the types of funding that are out there that are addressing uh, rural and underserved areas. So um, again, very important uh, goal for 2020 and, and on. Um, and then county building connectivity. There are some projects that are in the works. And if you have questions about that, I will probably um, take those questions down and defer to our infrastructure director who's very actively working on those projects. But um, those are efforts that are geared towards not only providing service, better service from the county itself, from its buildings and facilities, but also just building that network out and um, being, uh, just you know, basically doing what is possible for the areas around those buildings to you know every every bit of this helps to um, build a network and expand um, those those types of improvements to underserved areas. So again, um, the expert on that is um, could probably tell you quite a bit more, but I'm happy to pass some questions on. So um, with that, I want to talk about the website, because as far as um, having a great hub of information, um, the Larimer Broadband website is, is a terrific source of that. And we've made a ton of updates lately and we're still working on them, but really trying to update it on what's available so that you can learn more about the Larimer Broadband Initiative, um, what's happening with the county, um, and just keep up on those um, on that information and provide a way for you to sign up to receive updates and such. So um, the Larimer Broadband Initiative's tagline, uh, which uh, aligns with its vision is everywhere is, everywhere is somewhere. And um, that means that everywhere is somewhere that is important to be connected and to address connectivity gaps. Um, so there is no area um, that is, is unaddressed by this initiative. Um, so everywheresomewhere.org is the website, so that hopefully makes it pretty easy to remember. And just in navigating this website, there is at the very top, there is the opportunity to click on um, a link for the new internet connectivity speed test. Um, there is also uh, some content blocks to be able to click very easily to um, access the feasibility study. And in clicking on that the other day, I don't want anybody to get confused when you click on that and nothing pops up because it basically downloads a PDF uh, somewhere down here for you. So, um, uh, so just make sure that you look for that. So um, that will give a lot of information that is current and some of it, um, it represents what the broadband landscape environment looked like in 2018. It is a very uh, quickly moving um, topic with a lot of development. So there have been a lot of changes in terms of expectations, um, say of uh, utilities to be involved, of ISPs to be involved, the type of funding that's available. So um, some of the information has been updated since then, um, but a lot of it just really provides a great overview of what we're looking at in, in Larimer County as far as um, making these types of improvements and uh, what, a, what type of effort, the scope and scale of the effort and what the feasibility is for different um, possible solutions. So in order to uh, have a sort of to be continued <laughs> over here was so information about the broadband feasibility study um, was continued an update was provided to our county commissioners in February of this year and so you're able to view the video of that update it was a work session and provides a lot of information of uh, what the county's role is with regards to Larimer, or with regards to broadband involvement at this time. So just to get a current um, update on that. And then there's information to click on, which um, brings you to our strategic goal or strategic plan for uh, 2019 through 2023. And that specifically mentions broadband infrastructure as a priority for the county. So you can read about that there. There is information to um, get on a contact list so that you can receive email updates um, on uh, just anything happening with the initiative and uh, information that we know. And then there's um, 
items underneath where you can click to get uh, just different articles and other updates. Um, so that is our website. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the speed test. So a speed test launched on July 1st and we're running it through August 15th trying to get as much participation as possible because as mentioned that data is going to be invaluable in providing just really telling the whole story of what uh, you know what speeds are in different areas and one thing I want to mention is um, I have received questions about you know, hey, I'm in this area, my speeds are great uh, because I have satellite paying a ton for it, don't have a lot of data, so what is all of this gonna tell you? And I just wanna mention that the speed test does have a survey available um, to provide information as to what type of internet you're using. So if we see speeds are very high in a certain area that's not served, but um, you know, say, you know, great percentage of the folks are, are using satellite, or some other type of um, option, then uh, that that will provide valuable data as to you know what is happening in our um, in some of our rural and underserved areas. So um, just to give you an overview about the speed test, it's a bandwidth speed test, and it's an effective way for residents and businesses to measure the speed of connection to the internet, checks and records internet speeds, and we're seeking, as I mentioned, data to gain a better understanding of areas with insufficient connectivity where there's not a plan in place to provide adequate service in the foreseeable future. So um, as I'm sure you've, you've seen the um, some of our municipalities have their own uh, broadband utilities and we get a lot of questions about well I live you know in the area just outside of that service area or when when will I receive my internet I live just on the outskirts of Loveland or somewhere around Estes Park um, and you may be aware that that there are three at this time that have started um, broadband utilities and that's uh, Fort Collins Connection, Loveland Pulse, and Estes Park Trailblazer. So um, there are some areas that are that are close to uh, the service areas but just outside of them where there's not a plan to provide that service in the foreseeable future. So a lot of concerns there. Um, so the speed test is available to everyone and definitely encourage everybody to take the speed test um, just so that we can get a good picture of what speeds are just an overall, you know, an overview of uh, service in the areas. Um, but it focuses on residents and businesses within um, underserved and unserved um, places and meeting standard broad broadband and connectivity needs. Um, so again, the speed test is um, geared towards addressing areas that don't have adequate or planned internet service. So all locations can take the test to fully map the comparisons of speeds throughout the county and then identify, better identify digital gaps within the community. Um, the purpose is to validate existing data about internet service projects that have been completed. Um, we do get questions about that as well. Some of those questions are about um, information that uh, maybe federal sources, FCC uh, maps showing that service or that projects have been completed, but there's confusion about, well, why hasn't that made any improvements and those types of things. So part of this speed test outcome is to validate what's been done um, and just to figure out better better know where the gaps are to better prioritize resources and addressing connect, addressing connectivity issues and then to know how large of an effort this will be. Um, other questions that we get is, uh, you know, just seeing projects happening in the area, like for example, uh, large coils of conduit um, that are being laid in just some areas without knowing exactly what's, what's happening. So, um, a lot of that information isn't relayed, um, not necessarily even relayed to say the community associations and HOAs. So um, some of those questions can be posed to the, the service providers that are engaging in those efforts. Um, but a lot of that is just information that we don't have. Um, we see the same thing with the projects happening, but the information isn't necessarily available. Um, but the, having the speed test will help us to know um, you know, there might be conduit and fiber being laid in an area, but uh, there's still major gaps in connectivity. So um, just really hearing from our stakeholders who are living in those areas um, definitely helps to paint an accurate picture. 
So the initial testing and data collection from the speed test is, uh, has already embarked on July 1st. It's gonna be going through August 15th and hopefully we can get a lot of participation in that. And uh, the way to participate is to um, access this link here. And I will mention also that this PowerPoint is on our uh, website on the everywhereisomewhere.org website. Um, you can also access the speed test through the everywhereisomewhere.org website. And then uh, it provides instructions on how to use the speed test tool. Um, if you're not able to take the speed test due to technical difficulties, there is a, an email address um, to um, send a request for assistance. And I also have a number that I'm going to give you because it's probably unfair to be talking about areas that don't have sufficient internet service and then expect everything to be done over the internet. So, um, so if you have questions, here is an email address to um, access assistance and information. And then there's also a phone number here if, um, if you need to call instead um, to ask questions or uh, request information. So um, for now, <laughs> that is all the information that I have. But again, I encourage you to sign up for further information. I strongly encourage you to take the speed test and uh, definitely be checking the everywhereisomewhere.org website for further updates because they, they will be forthcoming. So um, I do invite questions if anybody has them. Thank you very much, Pam. And so folks, as indicated earlier, the chat is one way to pose your questions. Uh, the, there's a Q&A box down at the bottom. And also I think there's a mechanism for raising one's hand. And if someone wishes to ask a question verbally uh, by raising their hand, are we able to, we can't show their, their picture if they want that, it's just the audio? That's a really good question. I don't think we can show their picture. I think it's just audio, Commissioner. Okay, thanks, Michelle. So folks, are there questions of Pam? Uh, I think she did a great job. Uh, I actually took the speed test, even though I live in the city of Fort Collins. And, and, um, and maybe Pam could speak to this a little bit, but it doesn't take very long. I, I think it took me less than five minutes. And, um, and, and so, uh, and and it, it automatically determines upload and download speed somehow. And then there's some questions that you answer that are, you know, uh, that Pam alluded to. So it is really important. And it doesn't matter if you don't live in an unincorporated part of the county. We're, we're trying to get a sense, a map of the entire county and really get good information about the data. Uh, the data will be com analyzed, compiled and analyzed, and it will help inform uh, what will likely be a work session with the commissioners in the fall. And, and that'll help inform the next steps in our broadband strategic initiative. Well, and I would add one more thing, and it looks like there's something in the Q&A perhaps, uh, and, but I would add very quickly that there have been some very constructive and deliberative meetings with Poudre School District, the city of Fort Collins and Larimer County. And there are some discussions happening uh, with Thompson School District, but we're looking at how we might be able to collaborate to provide uh, faster and more reliable internet access, in particular to school children uh, that are living in some of the mobile home parks that happen to be on the outskirts. You know, for example, with PSD, we're looking at um, a number, of, there's about 10 mobile home parks that we've identified uh, where we might be able to collaborate and make sure there's more reliable internet service for the, for, the, for the children, you know, when the school year starts up at the end of August. So, Commissioner, um, yes, Hal has had his hand raised, so I'm going to go ahead um, and Hal, I'm enabling your ability to speak and you're going to have to go ahead and unmute yourself um, in order to speak. So the unmute button is in the bottom left hand corner. There you go, Hal. Good morning, Hal. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you.
You there, Hal? Can he type in the question? Because there's two questions that are already typed in that I, I'm happy to answer. Or, well, one's a, a good comment. <laughs> yeah, um, so Hal, we can't hear you. So I'm going to leave you open to talk um, in case that works for you. But if, it, if it's not working, go ahead and type in your question. But let's go to the questions that are in the Q&A. One of them is a comment. I think it's important to share. And, yeah. then, uh, and the first one's that's from Kevin. So why don't we go there, Michelle? Yeah, so I'm just going to read Kevin's comment real quick because it's just a comment. So Kevin said um, that he took the test while Pam was speaking, took up two minutes or less, and <laughs> results matched within 1% variance of his own reading from his Wi-Fi router. So that, that's good that it was accurate. Good, and I will pass that on. It's good for our developers and <laughs> that's great. web that's folks great to know. Good. Thank and you. It looks like Natalie is asking, um, those watching this presentation have some internet connectivity. Will the speed test be used to identify gaps um, where people who live and do not respond because they do not have connectivity? That is a great question. Um, and I have a, a couple different types of answers for that. So um, very, very valid concern. So if folks are not able to take the test due to connectivity issues. I encourage you to, if you can, do an email and send it into the web um, address. I can put that in the box here once I'm not um, talking. But um, and if you can't uh, email, then definitely call the number that I posted, and I, I can display that again if that's helpful, um, just to have that information, or I can type it into here. Um, so if there are those types of barriers, I don't have a definitive answer as to how to, what the workaround solution would be, but I am going to make an inquiry as to if there is a workaround solution. I have encouraged folks, um, you know, such as those, I you know Commissioner Kafalis mentioned some of the groups that are working with areas that are um, underserved in some of the communities out, just outside of the, the municipalities, and I, I've encouraged um, folks that are working with uh, those stakeholders or, or know them to um, maybe if there's some sort of technical assistance that they can provide or you know if the technology is not there definitely let us know because uh, as much as possible we'd like to offer some solutions so that you can take the test um, and if we can't then uh, to let us know that that's the issue we can count that as part of the data if we can't figure out a workaround solution um sort of the default is is call if if you can't get in touch via internet um so so yes that's that is and, a great and, question and, and, and then and, uh, I, excuse me i would ask yeah. that you go back to your shop and see if we can come up with a more definitive answer yes. and and specific workarounds that could be one of our follow-up items michelle uh, and then whatever information we get, uh, we, we have a way of sharing that uh, via email once again, or we're so dependent on this internet stuff, but we could- <laughs> It's a catch 22. We're like, oh, you have connectivity issues. Well, email us about that. Well, I, I, I would like to follow up on that in a more deliberative manner to see if there are some you know, spe specific plan of action to address what Natalie is raising, which is a very valid issue. Indeed. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Um, it looks like there's a question from Andrea who had to jump off the off the call, but it might be relevant to others who are still on the call. Yes. So Andrea asks, is there any plan to support neighborhood wireless mesh? Um, that is a group of homes connected via a single link into a larger network. For example, Andrea's property has a good line of sight into Loveland, but some of her neighbors don't. Could they connect to a larger network and share? <laughs> Another very good question. And um, I have to answer that referencing back to the milestones that I talked about earlier. And this question, I, it's, it's hard to, to give this, this answer because I know it's frustrating. Um, and the, the, the best answer would be, you know, here's sort of the plan and here's the steps, but we're really still in the steps of trying to get to that stage where we can identify and look at these projects and work with the partners who can provide the infrastructure, provide the service, 
um, and, and be eligible for funding to do so. Um, those, those, are the, um, those are the parts and pieces that this initiative is working very hard to get in place. So it is uh, well, well, part Pam, of could the- you, Could you help, for those of us who are not as tech savvy as you are and our IT people are, what, could you help explain what the question was getting at? Because what I heard is uh, an example of what we're trying to do in some of these mobile home parks where connection uh, can run fiber you know, beyond city limits if it's in the growth management area, but not necessarily, we're not necessarily, it's too expensive to run fiber optic lines to all of the homes, let's say, Poudre Valley Mobile Home Park. But they right. could potentially run fiber a line, and then somehow there's technology that allows it to be broadcast to all the homes so they don't necessarily have to rely on a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot, you know, a, a unit. Uh, is that what she's getting at or is it something else? Well, and that's, again, that's one of those that I need to defer back to our subject matter experts in IT to answer that. So, Michelle, I'm wondering if there's a way to, um, I, I tried to copy these questions, but I'm wondering if there's a way to save these questions so that I can keep them and have all of them uh, just more definitively answered and we can provide that information. Um, I think if anybody wants to type in their email too, along with the questions, then we, we have well, the emails. I have emails from the registration. Um, okay. And I believe the setting, I do have it set to keep the questions. So okay. I'll be able to um, take those and send them to you, Pam. Excellent. And I'll also be able to give you the emails of everybody that attended this morning. Right. By no means do I uh, mean to dismiss any of these questions. They're great questions, but I want to make sure that we get the correct answers that you're looking for. So and to have the questions and to take that back to our broadband team, um, then we can provide updates that I think will, you know, these, these are probably things that, that other people are wondering too. So. And, and we, we do have protocols in place that typically after one of these sessions, you know, Michelle keeps track of things. We have all the contact information for folks. And then she'll email me with, you know, what are some of the follow-up items? So I, I, I just want to make sure I'm included in the, in the follow-up. So I also have answers to these questions in case they come up again. Yep, of course. Thank you. Um, it looks Thank like you. we're going to try. Um, Hal has his hand raised again. So Hal, we're going to try to allow you to talk. Go um, Hal. I'm going to enable you. And you got to go ahead and unmute yourself. You might be on the phone. Um, it looks like you're unmuted, so, but it I looks I'll like try talk. I'll try talking. How's that? Yeah. Hey. Hey. This is wonderful. Hey. Using, oh. somebody else's, using somebody else's phone sometimes is a little bit daunting. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, have a, I have an answer for a question that was asked. Perfect. Um, everybody is wondering what uh, PVREA is doing with their uh, conduit and stringing fiber on poles and everybody's getting excited about that. What that is, is an internal internet or virtual, it's not a virtual one, it's a real internet. The PVREA is going to use for monitoring their distribution system, uh, distribution and where they're getting their power and all the other stuff. It is not going to be a public internet system. Okay? Al? Yes. Are, in your observations of, of some of the Poudre Valley REA activity, are they putting those lines in overhead near their transmission lines, or are they putting the, the, um, the internet lines in the ground like fiber optic? Because we, we are aware that they're doing that, you know, where they're expanding some of their transmission lines to some of their substations. They are actually installing fiber op optic line in the ground, but they're not lighting it up. In other words, they're putting in the infrastructure, and that's where we have to figure out, you know, a way to work together to, to get that fiber lit up. Can you speak to that at all, Hal? I can't speak to that specifically, okay. but, the, but the information, hang on, okay. say, yeah, but the information I got was this is specifically for Poudre Valley REA. Uh, the places they're putting it in the ground, I believe, is because it's better for them to do it that way. But come up, uh, come through Masonville, or you go up and down uh, Risk Canyon, you'll see all kinds of fiber hanging from their poles. That is not for the general public. 
Thank you, Hal. That's very helpful. Uh, we can take that back to our shop as well. And again, one more bit of information on this, uh, and not to get into a whole lot of detail, but we have had, you know, this was last year, but we had had have had at least one preliminary conversation with folks from Poudre Valley REA, and we hope to revisit that discussion uh, with them in the fall once we have the data from the speed test. But we are, you know, we're trying to work with partners, potential partners like our Poudre Valley REA, because around the state, actually, you know, there's a statewide association of rural electric, uh, rural electric groups, and they are getting in the internet game. And, and if we can figure out a, a way to collaborate on this and figure out the money and the resources, that to me would be one way to get um, high speed and reliable internet access to some of the rural areas in our state, or excuse me, in our county. I and Commissioner and Hal, I, I would just add also with the Poudre Valley REA efforts, I mean, the, they have had on the website information about a grid communication project, and I don't know how recently that's been updated, um, but, but they do post some information on there as well, so. Great, thank you, Hal. Yeah, yeah I'm not done yet. It yeah, would I figured, I, but I, I'm hoping yeah. if, if you have questions for me that they're all easy questions to answer. No, I don't have any easy questions. You know that. That's why I'm asking the question. Darn. Um, <laughs> it would make sense. It would make sense to do that. But again, if we don't know what their network looks like, um, then it's going to be a difficult kind of a thing. But it makes sense to do it. Oh, yeah, there's, there's fiber there. And if the, if the broadband is broad enough, uh, there's no reason why we can't serve everybody else. But I've also heard Yes. of another methodology using uh, internet over power distribution. I don't know how it works. I don't, I just heard, I just heard about it years ago and uh, it might be another way to do it because everybody that's got electricity should be able to get internet that way. I'm not certain. I don't know enough about it. Now I'll shut up. Thank you very much, Hal. Good to hear you. <laughs> I'm still breathing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I will respond to your two emails when I, um, this weekend. Yeah, I don't, that's other business. We'll take care of that together. I, I'm sure we will. <laughs> uh, uh, so folks, this is your opportunity to ask any additional questions for Pam uh, or perhaps me regarding this, the uh, broadband initiative uh, and the speed test. Uh, if not, we can move on to other topics of interest to you. I don't have specific things to update you on. I'm willing to update you. I'll do my best to update you on topics that you would like me to, uh, to address. Uh, but if, there's, if there are no more questions for Pam, uh, we would like to um, uh, be able to release her <laughs> to uh, her next, you know, her next, uh, next chapter of uh, her next step for today. It doesn't look like we have any other questions or hand raised. Um, Commissioner and Pam. So Pam, I think you're probably free to go about your Saturday. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you for hosting and um, I'll look forward to hearing more. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Well, folks, um, now is your time to uh, ask me questions on other topics or if there is a specific issue that you would like an update on. I, I, with Michelle's help, I, I think we can accommodate most of those requests. But if you can believe it, I've got nothing else to say other than responding to your inquiries and what's important to you. Well, it looks like Hal has a question again. So Hal, I'm, I'm enabling you and you got to unmute yourself. Go ahead. I did. I did unmute myself. You can hear me. Yay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I'd like to commend the commissioners and everybody else that's working for it with this uh, coronavirus. Uh, don't back out. If everybody's, if there's people yelling and screaming, um, gee, this is unconstitutional. You can't make us do this. Uh, all I can tell them is, okay, you guys just go die somewhere because this is, this is serious business. Uh, Larimer County seems to be doing a pretty good job of it and congratulations so far well, at least you know as I tell people this whole Corona 19 thing is a crap shoot and we're in it 
we're fighting against a loaded bunch of dice. So anything that comes from you guys in the commissioner's office and any place else that says, don't do this, uh, don't do it. Okay, I'll shut up. That's, that's the end of my thing. <laughs> oh, Hal, gosh, thank you. And let me just say a, a word or two about uh, the COVID-19 situation in Limer County. And, and Hal's right that, I mean, overall we've done, you know, the first reported case in the county was, I believe, March 9th, the first positive case. And if you look at the data dashboard on the Larmer.org website, you'll see that as of, um, I, I checked it this morning, I think we have 830 uh, confirmed and probable cases. We've had 30 deaths in Larimer County. I think we've had maybe 15 outbreaks. An outbreak is de uh, defined as two or more uh, people uh, testing positive in a, in a particular location. And then I think it also shows that of the 64 counties in Colorado, 61 uh, are, you know, have had some uh, level of COVID-19 uh, uh, positive cases. So overall, we've done a great job of flattening the curve. But uh, truth be told, uh, th there are some uh, uh, trends that are happening that we really, really, really need to pay attention to. And our public health department is, is doing an ama amazing job of, of, of paying attention to those, um, those trends. We, you know, when we got our uh, COVID-19 suppression plan approved by the state, we, uh, and, and we also got various um, business variances approved. Uh, we, in that suppression plan, you have to say, well, what are your early warning indicators and how are you gonna deal with if there's a serious outbreak that might uh, uh, make it difficult for our hospitals in the region you know, to handle the situation? So if you go to that dashboard, you'll see that, um, uh, you know, to me, one of the more uh, uh, relevant data points is that in the last two weeks, it's, it's, and it's all there, in the last two weeks, we've had five, five days where we've exceeded in a 24 hour period, uh, 15 positive cases. And, and that puts us kind of in the medium uh, risk uh, a category overall. But even though we've had that happen, if you look at it in the last 24 hours, it's when these things get reported to us. Uh, as, of, as of this morning, there were three new cases. But as of, 20, as of the last 24 hours, you know, we, had, we had more than that, you know, because we had a bunch from, that were reported July 9th, yeah, or yeah, July 9th, I guess. So, and then in terms of hospitalization, I mean, we've gone from, no COVID-19 hospitalizations, you know, maybe a month ago. And right now I think we're at 11 or 12. Uh, and then the issue of utilization, hospital utilization, the percentage of hospitals, you know, what, what's being used and also the ICU, ICU utilization. So all of that is in good, in good shape. But frankly, if we don't stay vigilant and, and do what many of us believe is, is sort of common sense, and that is to, you know, wash our hands a lot, you know, try to keep the distance from each other. Uh, you know, protective face coverings do help. We can get into a lively discussion about that, I suppose. Uh, but ultimately, if we if we start going backwards, um, uh, it's it's not going to help people who want to go to work, uh, who are trying to go to work, and businesses that are trying to you know to to, to get back on their feet. Uh, you know, two of the issues that we really need to watch out for, and I'll I'll stop after this is, uh, you know, CSU is planning to do some kind of a hybrid model in terms of uh, reopening in the fall, in the fall semester. And, and it's one of those things that's mega challenging because if you think about it, uh, you have thousands and thousands of students coming from all over the country and all over the state and all over the world. And, and you need to make sure that there's, there are things in place to test those students and to monitor that uh, in case we start seeing any, you know, any outbreaks of, um, of the virus. And then, of course, with CSU, uh, excuse me, uh, Poudre School District and the and the K through 12 schools, you know, there's there's ongoing discussions about, you know, how do we actually allow for you know kids to go back in the classroom uh, at 100 percent, giving you know families choices in this matter. But that's you know those discussions are ongoing, and anything could change in a month. So we have to stay vigilant. Commissioner, Brent has had his hand raised for quite a bit now, so I'm going to go ahead and um, allow Brent to talk. Brent. Brent, you'll have to unmute yourself, um, which is going to be in the bottom left-hand corner. Or if you're on the phone, you're going to hit star nine to un or star six, I'm sorry, to unmute yourself. Oh, there you go, Brent. I should, 
Uh, can you hear me now? We can yes. hear you. Yes, sir. You can hear me. Well, thank you, Commissioner Kafalis, for being available. You're, you're welcome, I have um, two questions, uh, which I emailed in earlier. Uh, the, this, and these questions refer to Northern Waters NISP uh, project proposal and how we can, how our involvement uh, is, uh, how we work with our involvement right now. The first question is, the two minute, with the upcoming commissioners open public hearings, the two minute time limit, uh, we many of us feel is unreasonable, especially when you give Northern Water, what I'll say, hours to speak. The recent planning commissioner's public hearing, I think started out in a basic description, and I may be wrong here, as two minutes only. But the, it was later we were able to have 12 minute opportunities to speak as long as we had, and I was one of those speakers, uh, as long as we had five other people who would uh, sign with me to that say I would represent them. So five plus me is six times two minutes a person gives you 12 minutes speaking time. And I think that that worked pretty well. It allowed you to tell a, a real story and build a, uh, get a point across where two minutes, you can introduce yourself and barely get into it, and then you got to leave. Um, so I'm asking, uh, I did send a, a letter to the county commissioners, emailed uh, a few weeks ago, asking for this to be reconsidered. Uh, Com Commissioner uh, Steve Johnson got back to me with a very nice response saying they just didn't have the time. Uh, but I want to say this is such a big topic that you need to make time. I'm going to ask you to hopefully make time. Uh, I'll re be respectful here. Um, so that's my first question. Do you want to respond? Then I have a second question. Uh, yes, Brent, I, I will. Uh, I, I do wish to respond. Uh, first of all, thanks for your engagement on the, um, uh, the Northern Integrated Supply Project, the NIST project. Uh, for folks who may not know, although I have a feeling everyone does know, uh, the, the, the Planning Commission is, uh, they've had two hearings now. The first one was for information only on June 24th, and then last Wednesday, or actually, yeah, a few days ago, July, um, yeah, July 8th, is that right? Yes, of course. July 8th, there was a public comment. And it's interesting what you shared with me, Brent, that initially, uh, the person who's chairing it is Nancy Wallace. And I guess the initial uh, uh, procedure was that everyone would get their two minute block of time. But apparently that was adjusted to allow for up to six people to share a 12 minute block of time. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering, Brent, before I finish answering your question, I, I know that the next public hearing of the Larimer County Planning Commission is next uh, Wednesday, July 15th. Uh, has, is, is the public comment period ended? And is it now the time for the staff to respond to the questions as well as the applicant? Yes, John, it's my understanding that okay. the public input, they completed it on Thursday night. They, after everybody, most people left, the Planning Commission formulated a list of questions to give yep. to Northern Water. So they are working on those and they are presenting their rebuttal to those questions or their answers this coming Wednesday at six o'clock again. There's no more public input. Uh, they were able to push it all into the one night and it worked really well. Uh, okay, that okay. Maybe answers. Yeah, thank you, Brent. And I, cause I, I did watch some of it, but not all of it. Um, and and the, to, to answer the, your question uh, regarding the commissioners, uh, all I can say at this point is um, uh, I, I frankly agree that a two minute block of time is, is not satisfactory. And I have raised this issue. And, and so far, uh, it's really the prerogative of the chair. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we've not agreed to make this, you know, to decide about allowing for some blocks of time. Uh, but I will raise the issue again because I, right, I'll be honest, I think it's important, uh, but we're not there yet. And, and, 
the commissioner hearings, to, to my understanding, um, I think the first hearing is August 17th, I believe. And, I, and we've blocked out maybe three, two or three sessions uh, for, uh, the, if we need them all, you know, in terms of, well, August 17th would be similar to the June 24th planning commission meeting where we receive, in, you know, information from our community development staff and then we'll, you know, receive information from Northern and then the subsequent meeting would be, um, you know, beginning the public testimony uh, uh, comment period. So I will bring back your uh, concern. I encourage you to uh, recontact Commissioner Johnson, the three of us, so we're all aware that um, that's something that you think is important and I bet other people think is important. Okay, I would like to add to that. Well, okay. It's uh, my second question. Yeah. My second question to ask you is, are we assured, you know, we put a lot of time into the, these comments that we gave Thursday night. I mean, hours and a lot of information came out, a lot of opinion came out. My question to you is, are we guaranteed that all three of you commissioners watched the public hearings from two nights ago or will still watch them on video because you can look it all up? Or do we need to say the same things all over again? Uh, you know, it's <laughs> the information, the comments are available to you to watch and to all three commissioners. So I hope you study those and give us a chance to say something new during your meetings. Can you comment on that, please? Yes, I believe I can, uh, uh, Brent. And if my, my esteemed uh, uh, public affairs director will uh, point out if I'm, you know, I have to be very careful about how we, how much we talk about this thing. Can't really get into substantive matters, but I think in terms of protocol and procedures, the answer to your question is I can't guarantee that the three of us are going to watch, you know, the, the, the two um, evenings and, and the upcoming one uh, through the video broadcast. I watched the entire, uh, the first session because I just want to make sure I'm understanding the information provided by our development, community development team and the applicants. So I did watch the entire four hour session on June 24th. I only watched portions of the, um, you know, the thing on, on, on July 8th. So I can't, number one, I can't guarantee that all three of us will be watching that. I can tell you that the packet that we get includes all of the written comments that we've received, you know, and, and it's hundreds of pages, whether it's emails or, or, uh, or, or letters in the mail or, uh, uh, you know, other kinds of more detailed input. We receive all of that. Um, and, and then it's our responsibility to review that. We also will receive detailed minutes of the uh, planning commission proceedings. So that's another way for the commissioners to have a better understanding of the issues that were discussed. Uh, and, and plus we'll, you know, all the, re the reports from the community development as well as the applicant. So that, that's what I can say uh, there. And as far as the, I would say that, um, uh, you need to say what, you know, make the points relevant to the application and uh, redundancy is, in my view, is good in this situation because we don't know to what extent the three of us will be looking at the discussions, deliberations of planning commission. So yes, present your information again. Uh, um, and as much as possible, it helps. I can speak for myself. It helps me when people are speaking to particular aspects of the application. Um, and the, and the uh, 1041 review criteria. But I, I think that's all I can say, Brent, at this point. I hope that's helpful. It is helpful. And uh, any other comment? Okay, uh, I guess that takes care of my questions, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there other questions, or uh, Michelle, I, I guess I could look myself. Yeah, no, thanks, Brent, um, and thanks, Commissioner. We did, we did have some questions come in. Um, they were well, there was some questions um, and they all related to NISP. Um, so I think you covered all of it. You, you and Brent together covered most of this. Um, Joyce wanted some clarification on the status of NISP and I think we've probably covered that. If you wanna elaborate a little bit, Commissioner. Okay, Michelle, finish your, your comment and I'll just add one more little point. Yeah, and then um, Natalie, to, to, the same, um, to the same tune said, 
John, we know you can't speak about NIST, but would you mention the examination of this permit is presently before the Planning Commission, who will be making recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners. Public input is invited. Um, and then she said, thank you for addressing this response to another participant. And, and actually, that's a really important point for folks who may not entirely understand the process. But, you know, ultimately, the Planning Commission, when it's a 1041 permit application, you know, they get the information first, uh, and, and ultimately their goal is to make a recommendation uh, to the Board of County Commissioners. And so that's a really important point. And the only other thing I was going to add, Michelle and, and friends and neighbors, is that at this point, the schedule uh, has us deliberating and ultimately making a decision on this 1041 permit application right around Labor Day. Um, uh, that's, that's the plan. Thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to remind folks that um, yes. Yes. if they're on the phone, that they can hit star nine to raise their hand. Um, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows how to, how to participate. Currently yeah. don't have any other questions or hands raised, so there was something else you wanted to maybe give an update on right now. This might be the best time, Commissioner. Okay, I think, yes, thank you, Michelle, gosh. Uh, there's just a couple of things I want to, I wrote down here that I wanted to mention. One is that um, I know what's on people's minds is the, um, the status of the uh, solid waste management facility and the behavioral health facility. And what I can say there, and if people have specific questions, I can, I can answer them. But uh, on the same night that the planning commission, uh, it's unfortunate there's a conflict there, but um, not entirely a conflict, but we are holding uh, the Behavioral Health Services Department and our Solid, uh, solid Waste Management Department. Are, are, they are holding a virtual open house on, on Wednesday, July 15th, 5.30 to 7 p.m. And people need to go to the website, you know, all of that, and register it as a Zoom a meeting, but that would be an opportunity to engage on those on the issue of the solid waste facility and the behavioral health facility. Uh, a second thing I'd like to mention is that um, maybe you've seen some advertisements in the newspaper, but the, um, uh, there's going to be a symposium on July 21st, July 21st, uh, that's, that's um, sponsored by Imagine Zero, which is a, a, not a group, an advocacy group that works on suicide prevention and also the Larimer County Alliance for Suicide Prevention. That is July 21, it's a symposium, it's 9 a.m. to 12, it's virtual. I will be one of the panelists that will be speaking to, um, uh, you know, there, there, there's, um, the groups are involved, Larimer County's involved in something called the uh, National Collaborative, Colorado National Collaborative, dealing with suicide prevention and best practices. And there are, uh, I believe it's six pillars that have been identified as really, really important, you know, for addressing this, this really critical issue that, you know, Lambert County continues to, uh, you know, have a really high prevalence of, of you know, and, 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 and frankly, incidents per 100,000, you know, in terms of the number of suicides, uh, despite all of our efforts and despite the, you know, the, uh, the work we're doing with the behavioral health services. Uh, but that, that I will be speaking, um, uh, assuming I don't have to be, apparently we were, yeah, I will, the, the plan is I have a backup in case something comes up, but um, I will be participating in a breakout session from 11.15 um, uh, to, to, to 11.45 uh, on, on um, economic stability. In other words, the role of, of, of issues that relate to economic stability, food insecurity, housing, childcare, uh, et cetera, because that's one of the pillars that this national collaborative has identified that as we all know, especially these days, there's a lot of stress and anxiety that can um, exacer exacerbate, you know, any underlying mental health issues that folks might be dealing with. So just be aware that this symposium is out there. I think it, it'll be good. You'll get an update on this on these pillars, and there will be various breakout sessions. And I encourage you to check it out. Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to let you know that Joyce said thank you 
for the reminder of these important meetings and she hopes everybody participates. Yes. As do we. And I wanted to just put um, yes. throw this out there too that if you're unable to participate in the Wednesday night meeting regarding the behavioral health facility and the transfer station sites um, that will be available for people to review on our YouTube page. Um, and there is a follow up questionnaire that everybody can participate in as well as long as you've watched um, the um, the the event either participated live or, or watched it afterwards. So I just Great. wanted to let everybody know that that there was an opportunity there. Excellent. Th thank you, Michelle, for that information. Are there any other questions or insights? I'm not seeing any other questions right now, and I don't see any hands raised, Commissioner. Well, so folks, think, oh, yes. I was going to say, I just want everybody to know that we always post um, these meetings after the fact onto our YouTube page. Um, so if you had a family or friend that didn't get to participate today, and they want to come back and watch us a little bit later, um, that's usually about 24 hours before we get it on our YouTube site. Um, but we will have this meeting up there for everybody to view. And actually, Michelle, this would be a good time to do the poll. Um, uh, yes, uh, one thing I wanted to bring to people's attention, I know we've lost a couple of folks, um, but the next meeting, and, and note that we've consolidated, uh, you know, I would normally do up to five community conversations in a month. And at this time, you know, in light of the uh, situation, the public health emergency situation, we're doing three and we've kind of combined the Fort Collins Laporte one. The next one is scheduled, I believe, for Saturday, uh, August 8th. If you can believe it, August is just around the corner. And this poll is asking uh, if, if, if you're in favor of doing it in person or continuing with this format. Uh, I am considering uh, maybe doing it out on the patio at Dasbog at our old stomping grounds on Cherry and Mason. Uh, because we, I think we can physically distance and we'd be outside. I'm also looking into whether or not me or my um, has enough capacity outside, uh, you know, to allow us to have, you know, 10 or 15 folks, you know, properly distanced, you know, to have this conversation and also um, not be adjacent in my view to the 54G, because I think that could get pretty noisy. So this poll is up. Uh, can Folks, what do folks need to do to participate? It looks like five of eight have participated thus so far, and sometimes it might not pop up directly on your screen. You'll have to okay. go down to the bottom and, and pull up the poll. Oh, We're at six of eight thus so far. Um, so we'll give people just a few more seconds if they want to vote, if they haven't already, and I will. Um, I'll make the votes available for you all to see. It looks like everyone who's voted is going to vote. So I'm going to end the polling, Commissioner, and I'm going to share the results. So it looks like every single person who voted said that they would like to continue uh, or they would not like to meet in person in August. Wow, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you for participating. and Thank you for conducting that quick poll, Michelle. So I think that sends a pretty clear message. Folks should be aware that, um, you know, my next meeting community conversation is July 23rd and that's up at Red Feather Lakes. And we have made the decision to, uh, there's a space there where we can, we can spread out, but we, and it's up in the mountains. So we are going to do that one in person um, and we'll see how that goes. And then the, um, the next Wellington one, which I think is scheduled for Thursday morning, August 6th, uh, we're going to do that one in person as well. And there we're going to do it at once again at our old stomping grounds T Bar Inn. However, they've expanded the they've included an out outside dining area there in the parking lot. So at this point, uh, barring big you know high winds and um, early morning thunderstorms, the the plan is to be outside. So we are going to experiment with those two, and but certainly I I hear what you're saying, and we'll we'll look at August eighth as another Zoom meeting. Commissioner, I just wanted to point out um, that Randy had a, just a comment on the format and he said, this format prevents any interaction between constituents. And I'm not sure if Randy thinks that's a positive or a negative. <laughs> well, uh, knowing Mr. Ross, I'm not sure either, but I think, um, I mean, this is definitely, this has value, I think, in terms of interaction. It is a safer way to do things. Uh, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm growing a little bit weary of, of, of Zoom and, and uh, GoToMeeting and, and all these other platforms. But you know, yesterday, for example, I, 
I was on a, um, uh, a webinar meeting. I'm on the State Board of Human Services, and there were some very, um, a couple of the issues were somewhat contentious, a lot of input uh, in terms of our rulemaking and all of that. But that meeting went from 8.30 a.m. in the morning. There was a bit of a lunch break, um, 45 minutes, but it ended at 5 p.m. Um, and, and, but we, we conducted our business and we made our votes. Uh, but, but that to me is the longest uh, Zoom webinar type meeting um, that I've participated in. Commissioner, um, I think Natalie just wanted to point out that cases are going up in Larimer County. So that might be one of the reasons that people are a little reluctant to meet in person. Um, yep. Yep. Randy wanted to clarify um, he actually, <laughs> hey, Randy. I was just joking with you, Randy, but um, <laughs> this is negative. The threat of a link with a virus is enough to stifle exchange of ideas. There's always a threat. And of course, Randy, yes, we don't, we want to keep everybody's internet security. Um, we actually very much care about that. And it looks like Hal has his hand raised. So Hal, I'm going to um, allow you to talk and you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Jen, uh, you made a good comment there about the multiple different ways that we have to get to a meeting. It yes. would seem to me that maybe uh, Larimer County would pick a methodology or whatever like Zoom and use that exclusively throughout everything you do. I know it kind of says oh, we're going to have a monopoly now but it sure as heck would make it easier for you guys and us guys to get it right the first time. Uh, Hal, point well taken, and, and Michelle can elaborate, but my understanding is when we do the public interface meetings like we're doing here, we always use the Zoom platform, and we actually have a license. We, we pay money. The county pays money, so we have a more sophisticated version of the Zoom meeting platform which includes this webinar option, which helps prevent any of the so-called Zoom bombs, I believe they're called. And, and so internally, you know, we have a few other like go-to meeting, which I don't like, frankly, and we have something high five or something like that. Um, and, and so we have those in, internally, but when we interface with the public, I, my understanding is this is the platform that we use, although we do the webinar as part of it, you know, to have some, oversight of, of who's participating and making sure we're not getting weird links and that sort of thing. Correct, correct, Commissioner. Um, the county exclusively uses Zoom in our public interaction meetings. And, and it seems like it's, it's been working, overall it's been working well. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me that, um, you know, with the public hearings, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the NISP is one, of, uh, one series of, of public meetings. But you'll, you'll remember that the initial timeline of having those hearings was back in the spring. But because people expressed uh, quite a bit of concern, because we were in the thick of it then, right, folks? Uh, the whole timeline was, was adjusted, and, and that's what we're dealing with right now. And so rather than making some type of a decision on that project, and in, in, in frankly, I think it would have been in May or June, you know, the ultimate decision will be made, you know, as I said, in, in September. So, and people were concerned about, you know, well, it's, it's not the same as if you're there in person and on and on, but, but it seems like overall these, we, we've gotten it down to the point where this hybrid model, uh, I think most people are, are satisfied with it. Um, and, and, I, and now in the courthouse, you know, the hearing, if you watch the last one, we can open up the three rooms in the, in the commissioner's hearing room on the first floor, and we position the chairs in such a way that, you know, the six feet of distancing, we require folks to wear face masks when they come in, uh, but we can accommodate up to 50 people uh, properly spaced, and then, of course, people can participate like we're doing uh, in terms of um, their, their public input. So that seems to be working, but I, I know we all want to get back to uh, the good old days when we could maybe shake a hand or give a hug or something like that. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, Hal. Um, Commissioner, I don't see any other questions or any other hands raised, so it's up to you at this point. Yes, well, I think that um, before it gets too hot, uh, uh, folks might wanna 
get out in their gardens or, or take a, a bit of a walk. Uh, I'm actually, if you can believe it, um, uh, we're leaving at 1030 uh, to go up and do some car camping. And the exciting thing is that our granddaughter, the one I brag about all the time, this will be her first overnight camping trip. So it'll be quite interesting. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to find a site. Uh, if not, I guess we could always have lunch at Mishawaka outside. Right. <laughs> anyway, I wish you all well. Please, please take care. Please continue to engage. Um, you know, our doors are open uh, and, and where, you know, the courthouse building is open and, and certainly folks can call or email me. Uh, I, I, and Michelle is very supportive of everything. I, I don't always get on top of things right away, but most of the time I do. And, um, and the county's doing the best it can to balance between public health, safety and welfare and making sure folks can earn a, earn a living. Yes. Take care. Thanks, Be well. Guys. Bye, everybody. Happy Saturday. Thanks a lot, Michelle. <laughs>